So I think the linear regression output in R is really informative, but if you don't understand what you're looking at, it can be pretty overwhelming and confusing. So in this video, I just wanted to give a quick explanation of each component of the regression summary, and assuming your model is good, tell you what type of values you should be expecting. You've maybe taken an introductory statistics course before, but I'll also briefly touch on some basic topics throughout the video, just to hopefully give you a better understanding of how this output can be useful. So I found this fish market data set online, and if we go ahead and open this up, you can see that there are four columns, the species, the weight, the height, and the width. And in this video, we're gonna make a linear model to predict the weight based on the height and the width. But I wanna preface this by saying I would probably include the species as a categorical variable, but we're gonna leave it out just to keep it more simple. And the other thing is that there's likely correlation between the height and the width, which will make our estimates kind of weird, but I'll touch on that later. So once we have that data set read in, we're gonna create our linear model, and then we're gonna view our linear model output. So the first element of the output is the call, and this is pretty straightforward. The LM tells us that this is a linear model, and then on the left of the tilde is the weight, which is our Y variable or the response variable. On the right of the tilde are our X variables or explanatory variables, so we have the height and the width. And then you might also see some other arguments, like for instance, the data frame that the model is using. Next are the residuals. Now the residuals are the difference between the observed and predicted values. So we've got the min, which represents the data point furthest below the regression line, the first quartile, so 25% of the residuals are less than this number, the median, the third quartile, where 25% of the residuals are greater than this number, and the max or the point that's furthest above the regression line. We don't see the mean on here because with linear regressions, the mean will actually always be zero since that's what they optimize for. But starting with the median, we want this number to be as close to zero as possible. Now I should preface that it's hard to define exactly what's close to zero or far from zero because it's relative to your data. So you'll need to use your intuition when it comes to interpreting these numbers. Anyway, we want the median to be close to zero, our mean, because it would imply that the model isn't skewed one way or another. Another condition of a good linear regression is that the residuals should be symmetrically distributed. So we want our min and max to have the same magnitude, and we want our first quartile and third quartile numbers to also have around the same magnitude. You can see in this case, the first quartile and third quartile are kind of close, but the min and max are really different. So we're definitely looking at some problems here. So just to review, in this example, assume that the blue points are our actual data points, that the red line is the regression line, and that the green line are the residuals or the difference between the actual value and the predicted value. So the residual is gonna be positive if the actual data point is above the regression line and negative if the actual data point is below the regression line. And it looks like these two points are gonna be our min residual because it's the point that's furthest below the red line and this is gonna be our max because it's the point that's furthest above the red line. And then in this example, we would expect the regression line to follow the data points, but you can see that it's not because there's this one leveraged outlier in the bottom right that's pulling down our whole line. So if we looked at the output of this regression, the median residual might actually be close to zero, but the min and max would be huge. However, if we remove the outlier and refit the regression, you can now see that the line follows the data a lot better. And here the median residual would still be close to zero, but the min and max would be much, much smaller, giving us more confidence in our fit. So the residuals in the regression output can actually tell us a decent amount about the fit of the line without even having to view a plot. So next are the coefficients starting with the names. And you can see by default, the intercept will always be included. And you can also see any X variables included in the model. So we have height and width. Then there are the estimates, which you'd use for predicting your response variable. The way that you'd quickly interpret the estimate for the height, for instance, is a one centimeter increase in height will result in a 4.825 increase in grams of the weight. Ideally, you want these numbers to make sense. Like for instance, I think that as the height and width increase, the weight should also increase. So these numbers should be positive. And luckily they are. But sometimes if you're doing a multiple linear regression and there's multicollinearity, or in other words, the X variables are not independent, then the estimates might be drastically different from what you expected and the interpretation might not make much sense. Standard error is the average amount that the estimate varies from the actual value. So ideally you want a lower number relative to the coefficients, 
and you can use this number to calculate a confidence interval of your estimate. The t value is a measure of how many standard deviations there are between the estimate and zero. So it's literally the estimate divided by the standard error. In general, if the t value has a really high magnitude, the coefficient is going to be statistically significant. And that brings us to the last column, which is PR is greater than the absolute value of t, which gives us a p-value for the t-test. If the number is small, and we typically use 0.05 as a benchmark, it means that it's unlikely that the relationship between the y variable and one of the coefficients was due to chance. There are these stars or periods next to your estimates, and these represent the significance. So there's a key down here showing significance codes where more stars implies more significance. So imagine we plotted one of our estimates on a graph, either the intercept or one of the slopes. And it's important to remember that this is just an estimate, but not the actual number. And that's why we have a distribution around this estimate, because we don't know what the actual number is. But we are fairly sure, 95% sure, that it lies within this confidence interval. And how do we calculate this confidence interval? Well, we take the estimate and subtract about two times the standard error to get the lower bound and add about two times the standard error to get the upper bound. We also might be wondering, what does it mean for this estimate to be statistically significant? Well, our null hypothesis was that this variable has no effect on the dependent variable, or in other words, this estimate should be about zero. But if our confidence interval is really far from zero, like in this situation, that's gonna give us a low p-value for our t-test, implying that this effect is actually non-zero and is statistically significant. The residual standard error provides us a measure of how much the actual value will differ from the value we're trying to predict, or in other words, the standard error of the residuals. The degrees of freedom are the number of data points that went into the estimation of the parameter. So this is typically the rows of the data minus the number of variables that we're estimating, and that includes the intercept. So in this situation, our fish data frame has 159 entries or 159 rows, and we're estimating three different values so 159 minus 3 gives us this 156 degrees of freedom. Next is the R squared, which I bet most people are familiar with, but essentially it gives you a measurement of what percent of the variance in the response variable can be explained by the regression. So this is an image I found online, and the example is showing how temperature affects the amount of money that a lemonade stand generates. It's a little tough to read, but on the x-axis we have temperature, and on the y-axis we have revenue. So on the graph, we see that the regression line fits pretty closely with the data points, and that the R squared is 0.81, which means 81% of the variation in revenue can be explained by the temperature. Now in this other graph, which is of a different lemonade stand, the R squared is obviously a lot smaller, which makes sense because the temperature doesn't seem to be the best predictor. And it could be that this lemonade stand is actually indoors, so the outside temperature doesn't really have a huge effect on revenue. Now we see that there are two types of R-squareds, the multiple R-squared and the adjusted R-squared. The multiple R-squared will show you the amount of variation in the response variable explained by the predictor variables, like I mentioned before. And if you were to keep adding more predictor variables, the R-squared would essentially always increase because predictors will always explain some portion of the variance. But this doesn't necessarily mean the model is getting better. It could just be that you're overfitting to your data. Now the adjusted R-squared, on the other hand, controls against this increase, and it adds penalties each time you add another predictor to the model. So this distinction doesn't matter too much in a simple linear regression, where you only have one intercept and one slope, but it makes more sense in multiple linear regression, where you might have multiple predictors. Essentially, you want your model to be parsimonious, or somewhat simple, but also fit the data really well. And if there's a large enough difference between your multiple R-squared and your adjusted R-squared, you may have overfit your model. So last is the f-statistic, which is a general indicator of whether there's actually a relationship between the predictor variables and your response variable. So a number further from one is actually better, but again, you can pay attention to the p-value on the side to determine if the model as a whole is statistically significant. And in this case, because this number is much smaller than 0.05, this model as a whole is statistically significant. So that pretty much covers the linear regression output in R, but I'll be doing another video soon about the different regression plots and how to diagnose your linear model. But anyway, if you found this video helpful, I'd appreciate if you liked the video and definitely subscribe if you're interested in this type of content. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll catch you in the next one.